So I was trying to figure out how do you set up the power of thinking unrealistic goals. And I'm going to go to the stat that was shared earlier on 2032, the amount of talent that's going to be needed to be brought back. And that is, you're going to need to set unrealistic goals in order to achieve those things. Um, but this is a growth story um, and a lot of learning story. And there's a human element of the story. And there's also a lot of the story that's associated with junior talent development. But I'm going to give a little bit of a different switch. It was actually done in a different country. So a little bit about who HTAC is. Uh, HTAC is, is a Southeastern Europe engineering organization. The story is in three years, three years ago, the company was 300 people. It's now 2,300 people. Um, the things that we're most proud of, of the fact of that is there was never one point in time that the quality of talent that we wanted to bring was ever in question. So on average, anywhere between only three applicants are hired out of 40 to 50 that are submitted. Okay? The other thing we're very proud of is an average churn within most organizations is anywhere from 15 to 25% in the industry. Uh, we're in a single digit, which we're very proud of. And so what does that mean? The people we brought are happy. They're doing work. They're being challenged. They're doing work that's around complexity. The other is, let this be for yourself. When you look at great places to work, scores, collateral rating, those are things that we're very proud of. So what I want to talk about is a little bit of the story. This is actually Surgeon, who's our global head of people and their team, what they did of setting some unrealistic goals. And I'm going to show you some things where the team doubted, had questions, this is impossible, we're never going to be able to do this. And it's a little bit about their story. So the things that are associated with challenging, associated with growth, if you think about competitive talent market, you know, think about uh, Central Europe, is an incredibly hotbed of technology talent. It's in comparative to India, in comparative to China, and in Latin America. The other thing is the school systems that are set up throughout all these areas. This is the number one talent position in Southeastern Europe for individuals becoming technologists, almost to the point of like healthcare professions and surgeons. We've hired surgeons in our organizations that wanted to become developers. We have psychologists within the organization that actually do our user experience. There are psychologists who work with them. So it's a very compelling industry within that space, but it's competitive. The other aspect of this is there's standards of hiring because we have clients. We have global clients that have certain expectations of the type of work that we're going to do for them. And we are not doing a lot of what would be shared services or low cost you know, types of capabilities. There's an expectation of digital products that they want built. So as an organization, we go end to end digital product development, everything from product strategy, ideation, design, architecture, technical strategy, and then software and hardware engineering. So the company's origins actually were in hardware working with organizations like Intel. So we have hardware embedded intelligence engineering and software engineering in the organization. So there's levels of standards that you have to have when you're working with the intellectual property of certain organizations. The other aspect is the whole story took, during, took place during the pandemic. So let's talk about some challenges associated with downturns, uncertainties in the market. Um, also the fact that there's a challenge that turned into an opportunity. So what's the biggest thing that happened? One of the biggest things that happened in the technology space during the pandemic was the ability for a Java developer to say, I'd rather work from home. And I want to do that for the rest of my career. And I want complex problems. And yes, Zoom is really cool, but I've been working with my team remotely for 10 years already in the whole industry challenge. And the joke I would always say is, um, being in the technology space, I said the last thing, and no offense if this bothers anybody, but the last thing I wanted to do after the pandemic was be in commercial real estate. <laughs> so think about the leases that are going to get downsized and changed based on what happened with remote working. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting. You have these complexities. And then the team said, well, how the heck are we going to do all this? And, in, and, and the interesting story is about a mindset shift. It was challenging a team to think differently. Um, but he did something that was really brilliant. So this is a fun statistic that's there. So there's a massive amount of growth that the talent acquisition team had to do. And if you asked him, he said, I had this thing I read about. It's called um, it's objection handling, but it was sharp angle closing is what he called it. And he said, our team had over 30 objections that they had gotten together and given him of why they're never going to be able to do this. And so here's the unrealistic goal that was set. That team was hiring about 10 people a month. And his challenge was due to 100 in a month. 
hiring at that quality level in that area. And then they had, they went away, they came back for a week, and then they presented him with all their objections. <laughs> so it's his story. I love the story that's there. But the next part of this is how did they do this? And what was the mindset that they changed? And, and if they think about the guiding principles you know, of the team, and, and I kind of look at this, and it's, it, it's because I don't have my glasses on because they're right here, so it's really hard to read. I'm getting old. And I'm glad, thank you for not using the year I graduated to, and I might make some movie references, and then you'll know how old I am. But knowing the competition, so these are the, th the five areas that they've had. Knowing the competition when you're doing any type of talent acquisition in a competitive space like this is absolutely important. Because at the end of the day, if you're recruiting and hiring anybody, you think you have power, but guess what? They can say no. You gotta know your competition. What are they offering? Take programs that they do. The other aspect of thinking about is, is listening carefully to the things that are important to candidates. Listening. So one of the things that we do in the process is we do not ask questions like every other organization does. We flip the circuit and say, what are the questions you have about our company that we can help you answer so we can understand if this is the right place for you and your next step in your career? Versus how many times are we asking questions about what experience do you have with this? What have you done here? Tell me about what you built. You have to listen to the things that are important to them. The other thing is, so be active. So the 80-20 here is, is an organization that was small and not a lot of people knew about them. 80% of the entire talent acquisition was done on outreach. And only 20% were done on referrals. There were not people coming to the website. There were not people applying. It was 100% targeted. And so by using this and also thinking about being creative, when they were meeting with individuals, what they had to do is listen intently and then, and then identify where we could be differentiated in a competitive market to provide them the career opportunity that they were looking for. And lastly, be humble. And I love the, the, the comment you're making about be humble. Even as hiring organizations in any area, um, the power is, quite honestly, in the, in the talent space and technology is in is not in the employer's hands as much as we really think it is. And you have to be humble about this. And they have to create environments and understanding what they're looking for. And if they get, as I mentioned before, they can say no, but create an environment where no matter how fast you're growing, whatever it is, humility is a, is a key aspect. So the other thing is, one of the things we did in terms of redefining our value proposition is there's three areas if you think about hiring. And we intentionally said, we can't be number one in every single one of these areas. <laughs> it's, not, it's not financially sustainable. So we took it the, the top the ones we wanted to focus on. So compensation-wise, we wanted to be competitive. But that's not the main reason. That's not the talent and the type of people we're looking for. Professional development, more importantly, and additional benefits. So I'll talk a little bit about professional development in a sec. The additional benefits are the things about their families care about. Um, and it's not about health club memberships and a cool breakfast or whatever it is, or food. It was what are the things that are important to them and to their communities that they're a uh, part of? What are the benefits that their families need? What are the things, and that was where the focus is. So it was development and their family, and compensation was part of that. And by, by focusing on those areas, we also identified the right type of talent and people to join our community, and also they happen to be amazing practitioners. So the other aspect there is, if you, if you look at there's this, t this philosophy of growing yourself by growing others. And it's something that gets introduced to every candidate or any individual that joins the company. Because from day one, regardless of how much experience that they have, um, we're actually looking at how are they going to help and develop and involve others. And so created an HTEC Academy. And this is about whether it's practitioners that have 5, 10, 50 years of experience, um, maybe they're moving into some level of subject matter expertise, but there's also a junior development program that was created along the way. And I'm going to make my movie reference here in a second. So junior development program was about individuals that had come out of school within a couple of years. And there were, when they kicked it off, there were 800 applications within our company for 30 spots. And I think the comment that I heard that stat the first time is, I think we need a bigger boat. But, but that's the comment you were making earlier about Junior talent want to learn. They need an environment where they can thrive. 
And when you build these programs in place that allow them to develop talent, they're going to amaze everybody. Uh, and, I, and I really do like the SAP story, by the way. I'm going to probably steal that. Um, but the other thing is, is talent retention. And, and so we actually have started making, I'll tell a story here in a second about talent retention, but actually making it personal. So I'm going to tell you a Lego competition story. So engineering manager last year uh, joined the organization and in his community, if you're familiar, is everyone familiar with the Lego robotics competitions? Ever? Oh, it's, it's amazing. Okay. Love this story. So globally, that first Lego League challenge is a Lego robotics competition for kids. And they're kids that are fourth grade to eighth grade. It's amazing. They're coding. And they're really coding. And I've got two sons. They're actually on the two pictures here. But the story is the Lego competition also happens to be a Belgrade, Serbia. Same Lego competition. And, but it's about developing the kids at that age. So when we talk junior talent coming out of school, I'm talking junior talent that don't listen to their parents, that are really interested in this space and encouraging them to do that. And so when I heard this story, and then they, and they was telling me, like, yeah, we, here's an example of, a, of something that was really important to one of our engineering leaders. And then we supported and sponsored that event. And they told me what it was. I said, my kids just did that a month ago. And, and it, was, it was one of those things that, for me, hearing that story, it makes me excited about being where I'm at and the family that I've joined. So the other is, is paying some things forward. So we went through some growth. And we have some clients that have said, do you have your strategy and process that you guys can use? Can you share it with us? And, and so what we're also doing is, quite honestly, it's almost like open source talent acquisition. We're giving it back to some of our clients, knowing that well, I'm a professional services firm, and they need to build that internal domain. But I also realize that they have to build that domain to stay competitive in their markets. But if we have certain things that we can share to help them achieve their goals, that's a great partnership. So we're customizing some of these things for them, understanding their environments and saying, this is how we could, our teams could do it with you, we could do it for you, or you guys can run the model yourself. And it is a way of all working together. So you're like, well, why, why is this guy talking about Southeastern Europe engineering talent up here, and what's the Minnesota story connection? So yes, I did go to the University of St. Thomas. I'm actually the fourth one in my family to went to St. Thomas. My grandfather uh, and my two sisters all went to St. Thomas. And some of the programs you were talking about, I'm like, wow, I really wish I could have gone and done those. Um, but the other aspect of this is uh, the founder of HTAC Group happens to be a Johnny. And, um, but it's an interesting story for him. Dushan um, actually is from Bosnia. And he was part of the St. John's program where he came over and went to school uh, in a little small town in Minnesota. It's a pretty amazing story. It was pretty fun. When I was learning about the company, the two founders realized where I went to school and where he went to school. And the other founder said, do you guys really need a room? Did this whole thing be? No one really understands it unless you're from Minnesota. But that connection there, uh, when we were talking about being part of this and then finding out it was being hosted here, I, I jumped at the opportunity of sharing and talking about the story. And, and it's Minnesota roots. You know, my mother's from here and family. And, and one of the biggest things that's known, and I've lived all over, is no one really realizes the companies that are in Minnesota. And even if you live here and you move away, you forget. And it's one of the best things that I've had and experienced the last couple of days getting reminded of that. Lastly, just to recap, a lot of this, happy to share the deck if anybody wants it. The biggest thing is learning from each other, taking an idea, take one idea. I've already have three or four and applying those, trying something new. It's a competitive space. It's an amazing industry that we've been. It's something that I've grown and loved. Um, but it's more about doing this together and maybe challenge your organization and yourself to set some unrealistic goals. Thank you.